there are not many electric estates on the market yet. Peugeot says, hey, we will deliver you one. And they also want to deliver that at a decent price. Does it work? We'll find out here with Thomas Nautigfühl in 4K full screen full length with the Peugeot E308 SW. So new generation 308, then the electric version, and it's both available as hatch or as the estate. We're going to focus on this one. It is in the GT trim, that's the sport here trim. And in the front we can see they do not focus on an electric look. They just want it to look cool. And I think that's also the right decision. Or what do you think? Should electric vehicles look like electric vehicles? I think there's no necessity for that. Then the new Peugeot logo has been introduced with this generation. Then headlamps here, LED standard and optional matrix LED. But in this GT trim here in the EV version, they're already standard. The length at 4 meters 64 or 183 inches, that's 27 centimeters or 11 inches longer than the hatch version. They both have five doors, obviously. It's just that the estate has some slightly longer wheelbase and, of course, then the longer overhang. Let's see what are the difference in the interior later on. It's a very clean design also here, contrasting roof rails. This all in high gloss black here then in the lower part. 18 inch wheels are all standard here for the EV version. They have somewhat an aerodynamic look. Turning indicators in the front, mm, pretty fancy, right? So they replace this vertical daytime running light then and it's supposed to be this lion claw. Where the turning indicator sound. I mm, think I have to get used to that, right? I activated it here for the hazard lights that you can see that spectacular. Look at that, how the tail lamps are shaped with the running light inside there. Then the turning indicators and the whole shape is like a sports car in estate form, isn't it? I think design-wise they really nailed it. Top speed 170 kilometers an hour or 105 miles per hour. For most markets that's not a problem. For the Germans, yeah, okay, Autobahn and so on, you get the picture. Yeah, but I mean, for most use cases it will probably be enough. So how do you like it from design? Tell me in the comments. And now let's check out the trunk. But wait a minute. Is this a case for the Autogrefu fake exhaust police? I would say it's a fake exhaust silhouette or something. <laughs> do you want to know how the Autogrefu fake exhaust police really sounds like? Help! Help! <laughs> that is actually sound when you have a gear in place and open the door at the same time, yeah. You cannot bear it, but it's of course also important that the warning chime is there, right? <laughs> Does it frunk or not? Da -da. No, it does not. Now it's time to show the real capability of this vehicle, because it's an estate. Let's open the hatch. Electric one, there we go, and then 550 up to 1570 liters. Here, this one you fold up like this. Okay, at least it has rails left and right. And then here is a good meter of 40 inches in the width. Underneath here, so nice floor cover here. By the oh, we have to fold up these first. That's not the most practical solution. And then fold this up, small space just for the charging cable. So uh, after all, you have to think about where would you put the charging cable here? It's small here, no frunk and so on. Hmm, hmm. Okay, you see here when there's luggage, there's still so much space left. The length here, there's of course a big difference then to the hatch. Here is good meter or 40 inches as well. And the height is of course here also very interesting. Here in the back, there's like 70 centimeters or 27 inches. And last but not least, we can fold the seats already from here, left and right, like this. And you see, they fold down very nicely. And the total length then to the seats as we would be driving is here at about 175 in centimeters or 69 inches. Car key, the one that Peugeot and Citroën have been using for ages, just that they updated the logo here now. Door closing sound. Hmm, decent. Like that. That's pretty cool. Some beepings where because of the ignition on. Then here, top part is somewhat soft touch at the inside of the doors. Even softer than here, the high grade leather red at the shoulder part. Window levers are somewhat basic and also in the lower part here, basic. But we have at least a felt like this, you know, felt covering 
on the top lower part so that when you put things in there they are not making so much sounds and not flying around that much. Seats, sporty style and in the GT trim here in the EV version you always get the microfiber that's pretty fancy good quality from the seat pretty much the highlight leather red outside and a lure would be similar leather red outside and fabric on the inside. And welcome to this cockpit, soft touch here in the lower part, all the structure also on the top part. Then here in the EV version you have these green contrasts, then 10 inch screen in this higher trim you also have these buttons in the lower part. So these are let's say digital hotkeys you can use but you have to X this view first like this. That this build up I think yeah we could also live with that, so more details to that. Lower console, here you have the gear selector like D and reverse P, B for the recuperation mode, inductive charging pad underneath here, then USB-C charging, you can slide these ones open for the cup holders, cubby hole without any covering here, but this is pretty cool here, soft touch leather red, and then it opens like this for more space underneath and USB-C charging. Click, click and the steering wheel is always special with Peugeot isn't it it is this gaming like steering wheel manual adjustment like this in and out up and down I usually have it in the lowest position then only the lowest part of these instruments are blocked you can also get them with a three-dimensional view then you have different layers on the inside and they say hey we put it quite high and like this then we don't need a head-up display under the infotainment system you have hard keys, you press them, it's like this cockpit style I would say. This for example leads to the climate unit, this one here to some vehicle functions. And on the left side here you still have a manual volume jog. Headroom here by the way with 189, 602, plenty of headroom on the left. The only thing is here the head restraint of the seat that is kind of really stiff and hard. The only negative point I would say but the comfort in the seat in general is really awesome. Great support, at the same time good comfort. So this system here has potential, but I think it's not really thought through. I mean, you have these hotkeys here, the digital ones, then the rear hotkeys underneath, and then for example the climate unit here, you can directly change it here. So it's also fairly easy for a non-physical control while driving. But when you then switch for to the navigation, for example, then they're gone. <sighs> Yeah, I'm not sure about that. So, what's what's your take on that? But the you know the speed is decently quick actually, so that's okay. What's fancy here when I plug in the Apple CarPlay, this lower button also changes here to Apple CarPlay. Here we go with the integration, also with Android Auto and also wireless. Rear seats, first of all the doors, hard pack everywhere actually. Then the rear seating materials here in the GT trim, once again, wow. It's a very cool microfiber also with this stitching here that feels really nice. So the comfort in general is good. However, you might think, hey, this is the estate version and it should have more legroom than the hatch because it also has more wheelbase. Not really, the legroom doesn't rise much. It's all one went into the trunk, so here, um, both hatch and the estate, it, there is not much legroom when there is a tall driver in front. That's the thing. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, the comfort is good when you have short legs or when the driver is not that tall. Headroom, however, is no problem. Charging 11 kilowatt AC, 100 kilowatt DC peak, still 30 minutes, 10 to 80 percent state of charge. And wait a minute. So they have 100 kilowatt DC, but still it's actually quite decent in quick charging. How is it possible? Because the battery is so small. 51 kilowatt hours net. That's really not large at all. So we have to see what real world range we can score with that. The reason of that is they want to keep the price low. Even a high trim vehicle like this here, you can get for less than 50,000 euros in Germany, for example. That's a decent price for this segment here in the EV class of course yeah but then we have to see what range we can score now in the driving part acceleration let's go Plop, that's a hundred kilometers an hour 60 miles an hour Plop, and that's 120 so on paper it says 10 seconds here for the electric version, the E308. 
we have to check in the time codes if that also fitted the official thing. It's of course not the you know most powerful electric vehicle out there. There are so many super quick EVs out there now, but that's not the main purpose of this vehicle. Yeah, I think it is a rather slow vehicle, definitely, but I also want to keep the price low, and then you always have to decide what's more important to you. However, you do still, you know, feel some boost when you hit the, uh, hit the, hit the pedal. So, um, yeah, in most situations, you will actually get along. This has been the sport mode, where also the throttle input is being induced a little bit, you know, harder, but usually you would probably leave it in the normal mode. They don't have a suspension that would change, so that also doesn't make such a big difference. Let's see about the steering, which is always so much fun because it's this gaming-like arcade steering. Let's see when I go to the sport mode. Any changes? Normal mode? Oh, there we go. Don't feel any major difference there. Um, the main thing about this one is really that it's so small, it's really fun to use. It doesn't feel most natural, I have to say, so it uh, actually follows the path of being, you know, like this racing game. You really feel like in a racing game here, but it's fun, that's the, the main thing. So a little bit more natural steering feeling would be cool. Lane change here on the motorway, done very well by the suspension. So it is fairly comfortable also when we go over some bumps. We have the 18 inch wheels here and that's also not too big. So they don't try to exaggerate things. And often that's actually a good choice not to exaggerate things. About these instruments here while driving. So I have put the steering wheel really low. I need to do that, that I can see something of the instruments. The speed is quite high in the, in, in the instruments. So I always see the speed then. That's actually not a problem. The lower parts of the instruments, they are blocked a little bit. Yeah, but see, yeah, the, like the lowest part, but uh, you know, but in general, it served that purpose that they don't need a head-up display. Put the instruments a little bit higher. Toyota has also been following um, this one. So yeah, I mean, you, you can do that. And I have the main information there. It's also very interesting with the 3D instruments. I see them in different layers. You cannot see it really on camera. And I also have the visualization of the car internal GPS, for example, in the instruments right there. Noise insulation is really decent. That's one of the key things they worked here on with the new generation of 308. So if you compare predecessor 308 to this 308 here, there's really large difference. And also I tested it um, very early stages to some of the competitors. For example, we had a, we had a Seat Leon um, there against the Peugeot 308. And there, this one here was way more silent, especially on the motorway at higher speeds. So done a good job to give you a little bit more elaborated feeling. Um, that's also what we talked about in the interior part. You know, some sport you're driving left and right. It's really a fun vehicle, pretty cool. There's also not much felt difference between the hatch and the SW version here, the estate version. Yes, the wheelbase is a little bit longer. That makes it a little bit less agile in really tight corners. But then again, you gain some more confidence when being here on the motorway. Yeah, it won't be the crucial difference. The crucial difference will be, do you want that extra space in trunk or not? Yeah, and it's really about the trunk, as we've shown to you, not mainly about the rear legroom, because there the hatch and the estate are more or less the same. It's really that you have more trunk length here, and it's actually pretty cool that you have more and more electric estates now. People do want to have that. It's good that they have this offering on the market. Let's do one more change here. Yeah, really starting to, to get the feeling for the vehicle. Already on the motorway, it's fun. Of course, I also want to take it to winding corners, but use the motorway here even more for the assistance systems. So we can activate them here on the steering wheel. One click, assistance off, cruise control, or then the drive assist. Drive assist then the most elaborated function. And then I set it here. Also at the green symbol in the instruments. And now with active lane keeping assist, let's see how smooth that works. 
so far so smooth, I would say. Yeah, I mean, you don't feel the movement, although you see here the motorway, it bends a little bit to the left. That's actually cool. Also, another thing that was main focus of this new generation, upgrade all of the assistance systems. Hold, hold the steering wheel, Thomas. Yeah, so, you, but is, is it capacitive or is it... Or does it actually need a movement? Let's let's try to find out. So you're supposed to keep your hands on the steering wheel, and if you do not do that, then this warning should come again. Takes a while. Keep your hands on the steering wheel. Let's see if I just touch it. No, no, it's not capacitive. So you really need like a like a movement. There we go, a movement input. So that is again not the most elaborated system, but you have again have to think about the price and this will be of course even more interesting when we test our consumption with this one here efficiency so that is to come right now agile driving and then the efficiency which will lead us to the real world range and now some countryside routes and check out the agile driving you can also once again go to the sport mode the roundabout really nice oh some more throttle input now Going out there yeah, it's really a lot of fun to steer this vehicle around. Yeah, I really, really love it, you know, like really enjoying the drive. At the same time, comfort from these sport seats. They're comfortable, at the same time they hold you tight, especially when you go a little bit more agile in corners or here. Some slalom reacts really precisely. They also feel the suspension is not set on the sportiest tone, but that's totally fine because they need that, that get good compromise, actually. I feel that the cool thing about this vehicle is it feels special, although it's not so high in the price. Yeah, the only catch is, of course, the small battery. We'll soon tell you more about what it is about the rear wheel range and so on. About recuperation, when you lift your foot off the throttle, then there's some recuperation happening, slightly. That's, I feel, a good approach because I made so many experiences now that when you have strong recuperation, when you lift your foot off the throttle, especially your passengers get sick from driving. You know, even if you, you are really gentle on the throttle, um, that can actually be a problem. Here, to make it a little bit stronger, you can press the B mode here in the middle console when you lift your foot off the throttle then. Then it is a stronger recuperation, but it's not exactly one pedal driving. That's not the focus of this vehicle. To me, meanwhile, I'm actually more used to than use the brake pedal for inducing the regenerative braking. That's, I feel, a little bit better, especially as for the G-forces that are applied. You just have a smoother ride overall, you know what I mean? Or what do you think here when you, when you have some experience from that EV driving? Here at about 90 kilometers an hour, so like 55 miles an hour, I can once again say that the vehicle is really silent. It is as silent as some way more expensive premium vehicles. So this noise installation is one of the key things really here in this new Peugeot 308. Is there a huge difference in driving between the E308, the electric version, and the combustion engine versions? It's hard to tell really. And the reason for that is the electric vehicles always have the low center of gravity. That means although you have way more weight added, it still feels agile and well planned on the road because the weight is so centered and low, close to the ground. And that's why you hardly feel any big differences between these versions. You would only feel that version, of, for example, on the racetrack or when you really push it in very, very tight corners. It's not the main focus of this vehicle. So is the E308 even more fun? Mm, maybe so. Um, overall, it's a very smooth, silent, but yet sporty and fun driving experience. So all the aspects in driving are very, very cool. And if you want more comfort from the seats, by the way, let's see if we can activate the seat massage with the voice control. Activate seat massage. Your voice assistant does not support the command to turn on the seat massager. Well, why would you need the voice assistant when you, for example, cannot turn the seat massage with it? So, let's try again. Hey, Michelle, turn on the seat massage. Of course. 
That's some kind of voice assistant, right? Look at that. Oh, wave massage. Well done, Michelle. Oh, that's the stuff. Hmm, that seat massage is really nice, very elaborated. That's not to be compared with any old seat massage. This one is a really good one. And hey, I mean, this is really fun. I mean, winding corners here, nice landscape in Spain, you know, a couple of feet, like, like an hour, hour and a half out of the outside of Barcelona and enjoying some seat massage in these sport seats with microfiber. Hmm. Good experience. And after our extensive testing loop for you here today, our efficiency figure is, together with motorway riding, 120 kilometers an hour, like 75 miles an hour, countryside and city, so a good loop together. Some 16 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers, that's around four miles per kilowatt hour, means a real world range of about 320 kilometers or 200 miles. Not too much. Yes, the battery is not that large. Yet again, the price is also not that high. Hmm, so it always depends. There is this argument where you say, hey, small battery, also less resources and so on, and more sustainable in a way. Yes, that's true. But then there's also the argument, and I do share that, the latter one, that when you have one vehicle with a bigger battery, you can use it for everything. With a smaller battery, it's always limited, city use and so on, not longer trips. And so you need it maybe as a secondary car. And is that sustainable? Yeah, you can argue both ways. What would you argue? Please share your opinion in the comments. And if you want to go for an estate with a bigger battery, it will be, for example, the VW ID7 or the Zeker 001.